I'm going to ask you to read Luke 19. You can turn with us there if you would. Luke 19, verses 1 through 10, please. Thank you. who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I have half of my goods, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house. Because he also is the son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Thank you, brother. We'll have uh, our opening prayer. Would you please, Mike? Thank you. We've all heard that story many, many times since we were very little. For as long as I can remember, at least, we've heard that story of, about the chief tax collector in the city of Jericho. And uh, For those of you just joining us, we're in Luke chapter 19. Jericho, as we know, it's a very old city. Right? It dates back to prehistoric times. It sits approximately on the map 17 miles east-northeast of Jerusalem along the plain of the Jordan River. The old city of Jericho is a mile northwest of modern Jericho, where we find it today. In the times of Jesus, Herod the Great, so this will be about 40 B.C. Uh, that this took place, Herod the Great and his successors built a winter palace there with ornamental gardens near the famous palm and balsam groves uh, that yielded pretty lucrative revenues uh, for the city. Jericho is now part of the country of Jordan since 1948, and kind of the restructuring of that area uh, following the Second World War. The road to Jerusalem was about 17 miles, as we noted. It rises 835 feet from negative 835 feet below sea level, all the way up to 2,500 feet above sea level. We know Jesus was heading in that direction, right? This was on his final trip uh, to Jerusalem, uh, where he would meet his death and ultimately conquer death. Uh, but we might say the road before Jesus, as he left Jerusalem after his stay in Jericho, was a steep one, both literally and uh, figuratively. I'm going to read a little here from Haley's uh, Bible handbook about some archaeological notes around the excavation of Jericho in the early 20th century. Dr. John Garstang, the director of the British School of Archaeology in Jerusalem and of the Department of Antiquities of the Palestine government, excavated the ruins of Jericho between 1929 and 1936. He found pottery and scarab evidence that the city had been destroyed about 1400 BC, coinciding with Joshua's date, and in a number of details, dug up evidence confirming the biblical account in a most remarkable way. The wall fell down flat, Dr. Garstang wrote. He found that the wall actually did fall down flat. The wall was double. The two walls were about 15 feet apart. The outer wall was 6 feet thick. The inner wall was 12 feet thick, both being about 30 feet high. That's pretty massive. We can see why uh, the Israelites would think that city was so impenetrable, right, especially just from marching around. But it really shows us the power of God. They were built not very substantially on faulty, uneven foundations, there was brick four inches thick and one to two feet long laid in mud and mortar, and those are the foundations of the walls. 
The two walls were linked together by houses across the top, as Rahab's house on the wall. Dr. Garsting found that the outer wall fell forward and down the hillside, essentially dragging the inner wall and the houses with it. The streak of bricks gradually getting thinner down the slope. The foundation walls of the palace, four courses of stone high, remain in situ, tilted outward. Dr. Garsting thinks there are indications that the wall was shaken down by an earthquake, of which traces may be seen, a method which God could have used as easily as any other. They burnt the city with fire, here we read in, in the scriptures. And the, the archaeological uh, event found that there were signs of conflagration and destruction uh, that were very marked along the walls. Garsting found great layers of charcoal and ashes and wall ruins reddened by fire. The outer wall suffered most. Houses alongside the wall were burned to the ground. The stratum generally was covered with a deep layer of black burnt debris under which there were pockets of white ash overlaid with layer of fallen reddish brick. In our last paragraph here. We also read in the scripture, keep yourselves from the devoted thing. Those were the instructions of God. What Garsting found under the ashes and fallen walls and the ruins of the storerooms an abundance of foodstuffs, wheat, barley, dates, lentils, and such, turned to charcoal by intense heat, untouched and uneaten, evidence that the conquerors had indeed refrained uh, from appropriating those foods. Now, Jericho in that period was, was quite different from the Old Testament city. Right, the, the city of Jesus' time, the Old Testament city, would be quite different. Herod the Great had obtained Jericho from Caesar Augustus and proceeded to build aqueducts, a fortress, the monumental Winter Palace that we talked about before, and a hippodrome in the vicinity of the more ancient town. Let's make some observations here about Zacchaeus' encounter with Jesus. It's a story, as I mentioned, that we've all learned about since our Sunday school classrooms. We had our little felt figures on our felt boards. Some of those are still alive and well today. There's a really popular song we sing about the wee little man. Still saying that with our kids. Uh, I like to think of Zacchaeus uh, for having an open heart. Somewhat like that uh, of an eager child, an enthusiastic child. Uh, to see and observe uh, the, the things around him. Ultimately to spend time with and to want to please uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. The meaning of the name Zacchaeus is pure. Looking at verse 2, you know, nowhere else in the Old Testament is that title found. Chief tax collector, I should say the New Testament rather. Chief tax collector. Jericho was a major toll collection point. We talked some about the revenue going in and out from the natural resources, but it also sits on the very important um, highway running east and west, and of course the Lord traveled that way as he was going to Jerusalem. Uh, many other people did as well. Very important toll collection point for taxing goods uh, for the Roman Empire. And that was Zacchaeus' uh, industry. Now we're going to talk about this a little bit. There's no indication other than Zacchaeus being involved with tax collection that, that he was an evil man or lived an evil life. Uh, we don't really have an indication of that in the scriptures, although we are aware of the general reputation of tax collectors. But don't you just love the enthusiasm of Zacchaeus to see uh, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? You can picture him, you know, running along the roadside. You know, we've been to parades, and you can't, you can't get the viewpoint you want, right? You just can't get up close uh, to see what you want. And you woke up early, and you got out there, but you can't witness the great progression. You're just not able to see, and not even caring what anyone thinks, especially given his position. I love his enthusiasm to just climb up to see Jesus. Nothing's more important than him. He didn't care what people thought, uh, he just climbed the sycamore tree. And I love the, the trees described for us in this account. That, that type of detail really is another thing that makes it special. In his commentary, Kaufman writes that such a maneuver suggests his forged foresight, energy, determination, and ingenuity. It would be well if all men exhibited such qualities in the pursuit of our Lord Jesus Christ. When I think about our lesson last week, would I have believed? Right? And Zacchaeus wasn't short on belief, and, and he wanted to see uh, he see the man that so many people believed in. And I wonder if I would be that same way or if I would be too busy uh, with my duties uh, that day in Jericho. Yes, sir. Speaking of sycamore trees, they're still there. And yeah. of course, there's at least one that they say, oh, this was the one Zacchaeus found. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> what do you think? Like, they, Yeah, they do say that, right? Um... Do you believe it is? 
No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, they still like collecting their revenue. They but I'm glad they're not. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I mean, as a little boy, uh, I grew up in West Virginia, so there were trees and mountains everywhere, right? So climbing, you knew some trees you weren't going to climb, right? Because they're, they're straight up, and uh, I wasn't that great, right? I mean, like, Physically, I'm not much of a built like a climber, right? But I could get up a sycamore tree. You put the horizontal branches down low and close to the ground, I'm all up in that. Uh, and that, so that was, uh, I think that was about Zacchaeus's climbing skill too. <laughs> it, I would love to see that that tree. That's very, that's very awesome. Uh, I love that Zacchaeus received the Lord joyfully. Uh, that's what we can read right there in the scripture that he received him joyfully. I wonder if he and Matthew became immediate BFFs, right? <laughs> oh, you're the tax collector that Jesus called as one of the apostles, right? Like, Jesus, I'm here. You like tax collectors. Like, I'm willing, I'm willing to follow you. Um, I wonder if they became immediate friends, such similar backgrounds there. Christ obviously recognized that same sort of open-heartedness in both of them, if you will. Um, we can read of the Lord's omniscience, of his divine all-knowingness by his statement to the wee little man, Today I must abide at thy house. Of course, the many onlookers grumbled that these two had linked up, didn't they? It's almost like they uh, had some preconceived notion about what they were going to think about Jesus, and then they were just looking for evidence to support what they thought. Right? We see that over and over again. Don't we hear with those grumblings the same words of the Pharisees from our previous weeks? Why does your master spend time with tax collectors and sinners? It's an old refrain. We say rightly that the teachings of Jesus are amazingly consistent through the scriptures. And we can say rightly that the grumblings against him were equally consistent. What a manner of spiritual blindness. Remember our, our lesson last week, he who has eyes to see, let him see. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. It doesn't take long at all for the repentant, loving side of Zacchaeus to show itself in his meaningful actions and commitments. He received Jesus into his house joyfully. And then proclaims that he's giving half of his goods and restoring fourfold anything that he took wrongly. So it's the mere presence of Jesus, the Lord's willingness to spend time with Zacchaeus, to allow himself to be welcomed into fellowship with him. It, it triggers this sort of repentant, must please Jesus sort of response. And we, we can talk about the, the tense of the verbs used there, right? That the say, was Zacchaeus always that way? Lord, I've always given half of my goods to the poor. Or was it just an immediate, Lord, I'm going to give half of my goods to the poor uh, right now because you're here and I want to please you. So some commentators claim that there's the past tense usage of the verbs here referring to Zacchaeus' actions. Uh, Bowles in his commentary, he says, it seems as if Zacchaeus was expressing what he had done and that which he had proposed to continue doing. It's true that we're not told that Zacchaeus was a sinner, we have the reactions, we have the claims of the crowd, right, and the, the reputation of him being a tax collector, or at least the chief or the supervisor of the tax collectors. However, the scriptures don't tell the readers specifically that this was the chief tax collector who had defrauded anyone, although we're aware of that general rep representation. Are there any comments on that? I, I know when, when I was a kid and I first heard the story, I thought Zacchaeus was repenting in that moment from his previous evil lifestyle, right, and he had agreed to turn it around going forward. But it's interesting to think that he was a good man all along. And that's why Christ chose to fellowship with him. Yes, sir. I heard a sermon on that very thing, thing one time. And the preacher said, kindness changes people. Kindness is a fruit of the Spirit. And Jesus acknowledged him and brought him out of the tree and changed him just like that. Yes. Agreed. Yes. I tend to think that you know, he, he was like that all along because, one, he's seeking Jesus. He's, he's looking for something. There's, that tells me there's a heart already there that's, that's available. Uh, very similar to Cornelius. Cornelius was not a bad man. He, he was doing all the right things, and he only needed the one thing. He needed to find Jesus. Yes. It's really interesting to think about. Before this study today, I hadn't much thought about that opinion. But actually, if we go by the text, it does have the past tense in there that says that he, he had always given, uh, Lord, I've always given half of my goods uh, to the poor. And if I, if I have wronged anyone, you know, I'll restore it fourfold. Yes. I think, I think that fact kind of speaks to his character and probably 
and it, how incredible of a guy he had to have been to have that attitude, which would have been really contrary to most of his peers. I mean, most, giving giving of your funds was very contrary to the reputation of, of a tax collector, much less a chief tax collector. But he seems to have not only risen to that title, which, if I understand how all that worked, he had to be appointed to that. That was a almost like a an elected position to, to be chief. So his peers not only thought enough of him that he gave part of his money away, which is what they weren't doing. Uh, so Zacchaeus, you know, like, like Mark said, I mean, he had the heart to seek before he ever encountered Jesus. And then we see the change that happened once he actually got there. But it kind of took some prerequisite to even get to the point of looking. And, and Zacchaeus seemed to be a, a pretty remarkable guy. He's one of the few, if... if if we could have any further story in Scripture of what happened after we kind of lose track of him, Zacchaeus is pretty high on my list. I would have loved to have known what happened after, because that's about all we have of him. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it makes his character a lot more fascinating, I think, to, to view him of, of high reputation and a good heart and a pure heart. Uh, knowing that his name means pure, <laughs> that's just another tidbit. Any other comments? It says that Jesus says today salvation has come to this house since he also is a son of Abraham. And we know from Romans and Galatians that a son of Abraham would be somebody who's faithful and has faith in God. And so, you know, he's, he's recognizing Zacchaeus' faith of what he's done, climbing up that tree and looking for Jesus. And so he's receiving, you know, the congregation that is the sons of Abraham. Broadly speaking, but certainly Zacchaeus falls in that. Yes, that's a great point. Thank you. One commentator suggested that Zacchaeus is the same publican from the parable, the Pharisee and the publican. Remember, we studied that a few weeks ago. There's no evidence for that in Luke 18, 10 through 14. We have no way to know for sure. But what was Jesus' reply? Matt just brought that up. That's a, the perfect segue. So Jesus' reply to Zacchaeus' promise of, of either future action or continued action, or, or both, um, what was his reply? Today salvation has come to this house since he is also a son of Abraham. For the son of man, there's Jesus' favorite title. Again, right, the son of man has come to seek and save. That was, was lost. Jesus then continues teaching using the technique of parables. He continues to teach the crowd. He tells the parable of the ten minus. And we're not going to go into that parable really in much detail this morning for time's sake. But it's uh, important to know that Jesus may have taught this parable to those who were expecting the kingdom of God to appear immediately. Right? They're close to Jerusalem. Jesus is on his way uh, to Jerusalem with his disciples, with a large crowd there. Um, they may have been very much expecting a political Messiah. And we know, of course, that Jesus was going to die instead of being raised as a king over a physical kingdom. But with his death, burial, and resurrection, we can see in the fullness of Christ and the fullness of time, as the scriptures call it, how the kingdom as the Lord's church here on earth has come to be. So John mentions several trips to Jerusalem by Jesus during his ministry. Matthew, Mark, and Luke recount only one, which occurred as Jesus prepared for his triumphal entry, a subsequent death, and resurrection. Jesus encounters with this large group of little children comes just before arriving in Jericho, just before the story of Zacchaeus. Mark 10.46 reads, And they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, and that's Mark's account. <laughs> that's Mark's account of, of Jesus' trip to Jericho there on his way to Jerusalem. He and his disciples came to the city. As they were walking by, a great crowd was there. Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting there, presumably with the crowd, right? uh, possibly there every day, right? Because as passers by uh, go to and fro, he can he can collect his charity and uh, and meet his physical requirements. Saying they'll just get get the money he needs to live. Jesus heals Bartimaeus, and so we find ourselves there with another another name change, right? Formerly blind man, another formerly blind man. You know, as Christians, we should refer to ourselves as formerly blind men and women too. Uh, for once we were blind, but now we see uh, in spiritual terms. This also reminds me of our lesson last week, uh, since it was another uh, as he was passing by type moment, right? 
I mean, many of Jesus' most memorable works, at least the ones we have recorded for us in scriptures, were in those moments when he was just traveling from point A to point B, or working here or there on this or that mission. Very important work, the Father's business. As he passes by, he heals this man and that man, gives them sight, brings the light. Here Jesus was walking to Jerusalem for the Passion Week to save all humanity. The culmination of his years on this earth, the very purpose for him humbling himself to come down from heaven. And Bartimaeus shouts to the Lord. Those around him rebuke him, right? Those around Bartimaeus rebuke him. He's too busy. And Jesus was busy. That's the most important mission, the most important mission of all time that he was on as he was passing by Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus shouts to the Lord. He gets rebuked. He's too busy. Stop disturbing him. You're a nobody. Leave him alone. Why would he meet with you? Then Jesus can be heard over the rebukes. He stops walking, and the Lord commands, call him. Let's read this wonderful encounter of Bartimaeus and and Jesus. If you have Mark 10, 46 to 52, may I ask you to read that now, please? I, I passed it out, so someone should have it. Mark 10, 46 to 52. Jericho, and he he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd. Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside, and when when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began crying out and saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And they called the man, blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want of me? Uh, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Thank you very much, brother. <coughs> Bartimaeus knew, knew. Bartimaeus knew where his, uh, where his healing could come from. And I hope we do too. I hope we know where our spiritual healing comes from. I think we do. It comes from Jesus Christ. Bartimaeus heard, presumably, right, that, that Jesus was passing by and he started shouting at him. Lord, Lord, uh, he, he didn't, couldn't see. He couldn't see exactly where to walk, which direction to go to, right? And Jesus was walking by, mobbed by crowds. Bartimaeus is there, uh, presumably being stepped all over as the crowds pass by and the number of people expand. Lord, Lord, and Jesus stops everything. There are people rebuking Bartimaeus, screaming at him to stop, and Jesus says, call him, and they bring him over. And what a beautiful sight. Even before the healing, what a beautiful sight that must have been. And it's very similar to the story uh, of Zacchaeus uh, that we read in that same chapter. It's very similar to Jesus' encounter uh, with little children uh, that we're going to study this morning as well. Mark doesn't record the account of Zacchaeus, but you do know what a, what's very interesting. It's very likely that Zacchaeus was among that large group of people who were along the roadway uh, there at the gate of Jericho. Uh, previous to that day, he may have known or at least encountered Bartimaeus uh, in his passing by, right, as he did his daily business. It's not likely that Zacchaeus would have helped Bartimaeus if we believe that Zacchaeus was an evil man before he encountered Jesus. But it's very likely that Zacchaeus would have helped that same blind beggar if he was the good man, right, if we believe that he was a good man before he followed Jesus and told Jesus he was going to continue on his commitments and expand his commitments of faith. It's pretty interesting to think about. But, um, who were the two people most impacted during Jesus' final trip to Jericho? Who are these two people here? The blind beggar and the chief tax collector. And if that isn't something that's very consistent with Jesus throughout all of his teachings and all of his life, I don't know what is.
Yeah, compare the time in, in Mark's account to the timing in Luke's account, right? It, it almost seems like you're not, we're not sure if the healing of Bartimaeus happened before the encounter with Zacchaeus or after the encounter with Zacchaeus. And I checked out three or four different commentaries to see if any of the commentators touched on that subject and all were too scared to do it. And I was too scared to bring it up. And I don't know why I did. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But I'm sure it's not an inconsistency, and I just need to study it more. But yeah, look at the timing on those, those two. Has, any, has anyone looked at that previously, and they're willing to proffer a comment on it? One seems that Jesus encounters Bartimaeus on his way into Jericho and heals him, and then so the later events would happen, that, like, like Zacchaeus, after the healing of Bartimaeus. The other seems that Jesus had been in Jericho, taking care of Zacchaeus, the other work that he was doing and was on his way out when he encountered Bartimaeus at the gate. So I, I purposely designed my wording so I didn't address that. But it's interesting to think about. I, I don't know which one, which one it is. But I'm wide open to any, any comments or anyone who does. Yes? That, but um, I, I do think it's remarkable that, um, as you said earlier, Jesus is on, is on his way to the cross. Yes. And, you know, he's on the way to the cross to die for sinners like us. And if I was knowing that and he knew it, he told his <laughs> disciples, I'd be thinking about, Matt Evans, I'd be like, uh, I need to, I'd be introspective. I wouldn't I'd block out people outside of me. I'd go try to see You're my, doing enough, my right? friends. And, You're doing enough. Yeah, you know, do, do whatever else that I, I wanted to do. But Jesus isn't thinking that way. He's, he's looking out. And he's going to these seemingly low people in life and reaching out. Pretty well, pretty I love well. the ability to live in the moment. It's something that I think I so much struggle with, and maybe you do too, our ability to live in the moment. And to, like, whatever is right in front of our face, right? To, to live in that reality and make the right decision for that time, for right at whatever is in front of our face. I'm always, like, like Matt said, I too would be thinking about the business ahead of me. They're 17 miles down the road in Jerusalem. Am I going to hold up? I hope I'm going to do okay. Uh, I would, my mind would be absorbed on that. It wouldn't be focused on the, the blind beggar calling, Lord, Lord, or, or the man on the sycamore tree. Uh, and I think that's very much his ability, Jesus' ability to, to live in the moment. There. Yes. It's interesting because, like you, I, I think my mind would have been completely preoccupied. But you think about the interactions Jesus had with Bartimaeus and with Zacchaeus changed their lives completely. And, 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 and I think it goes to show not, not only how much interacting with Christ can change everything, uh, but it can be a relatively small moment in the grander scheme of things. But making the right choice in the moment, like you said, not thinking past or present, but thinking what... What do I need to do today? Um, and they obviously, you know, they saw Christ for who he was, and it changed everything. And, and in the big scope of what Christ was doing, it was a relatively small thing. Um, but, but in their lives, it was everything. Yes. Such a great point. I mean, we think about the events, events we might be looking forward to or planning two, three, four weeks from now, and we, we're busy and preoccupied with that, and we might miss out the opportunity to do something good to even see the opportunity to do something good right in front of us today. And I think it's those kind of actions, those kind of today in the moment actions that really make the goodness of this world spin round, right? That's, that's how we let our lights shine. That's the love of God that we see uh, in the world. There's those types of little things. We often overestimate them. we are just smiling at someone saying good morning or holding the door or actually materially helping someone. Um, that it means a whole lot. And so I just challenge myself, and it's probably a good challenge for all of us to live in the moment a lot more because those things that really echo in eternity. Yes, sir? Just going from voice to another. So we frequently see the words, he had compassion mm. on them. And so do we have eyes and hearts of compassion that as we go through the day, we're, we can see that need and we have compassion? I mean, that's, that was his example. Yes. Yeah, that's a great phrase. He had compassion. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. So interesting, because you were talking about he's heading to the cross. He's heading to the cross to save these people from sin, which is a far greater thing than what they needed. Mm -hmm. And yet he took the time.
time to meet their need. They need a physical need, but you know he's heading to to save them. You know his the sight was a problem, but the spiritual need was much more important. Yes. But it kind of lets you know that meeting people's needs is also just as important as the the saving grace that they need as well. Yeah, that's a great insight. Very true. This is especially important to Bartimaeus. Is <laughs> that they're blind for years, right? Having having his sight, even if it's only for a certain number of years and that he was left on the earth. And even though Jesus was going to deliver eternal life after that, it's still very important to him in that moment, for sure. Yes. Yes. Oh, that's true as well. Yes. Very true. It's so hard to do, though. It's so hard to live in the moment. Yes. Why would you tell him to be quiet if he was trying to get Jesus' attention? Yeah. And so we have to keep that in mind. There are many people that have been, I could say, touched by Jesus in a sense, and they want to tell people about it, but they're happy about it. So you can't take the emotion out of it because being a Christian is an emotional thing. That's very true. Yeah, thank you for that. I love that he couldn't see, the blind beggar couldn't see, so he shouted out. Zacchaeus could see, and all he was all about the mission of making sure he got that sight, making sure he got that line of sight to Christ. And Christ back to him, and then we see what happens after that. Let's back up a little bit. Let's back up a little bit in the same chapter, uh, Mark chapter 10. So this is before Jesus arrives at Jericho, in the beginning of the chapter there. We can read in the first verse of the chapter that he was in the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan. So, so the Samaritans had stopped him from going through Samaria, right? There's some thought that he had to cross over the Jordan. So he's in the region of the Jordan, uh, Judea beyond the Jordan, on his way to Jericho. Crowds again gathered to see him, and he began to teach them. Who has Mark 10, 13 through 16, please? And they were bringing children to him so that he might touch them and decide to rebuke them. And when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it at all. And he took them in his arms and began blessing them and laying his hands upon them. Thank you, sir. The children are very obviously considered by many uh, of Jesus' followers and disciples to be an annoying distraction. And the people were bringing children for the traditional blessing at the time, right? Lay, laying the hands on, laying the hands on the children, especially from one generation to the next. And we read again that Jesus' disciples rebuked them for bringing children to the Lord. This is despite Jesus' teachings just a short time before in the previous chapter in Mark chapter 9, verses 26 through 37. There might be 36 and 37 there. If you have that verse, please read that. Mark 9, 36 and 37. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. And Jesus says, For to such belongs the kingdom of God. And there's that type of childlike trust. Right? It's hard to find the words to describe it. A desire to be close to Jesus. A desire to know him. Like to love him, to kind of know where that you're supposed to, that's where you're supposed to be. Right? Like that's, that's your safe space. That's, uh, he created us. He, he loves us. That's where we're supposed to be postured toward him, turned toward him, connected toward him, to, connected into him, right? the, the vine and the branches. And that's where Jesus loves for us to be as well. It's that type of childlike trust that Jesus says, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. It's easier uh, to depend on him. Um, than it is for us to take care of our business by ourselves. Like relieving our anxiety, as we talked about. Living in the moment with Jesus is a very anxiety-free place to be. Yes, sir. 
God keeps us when we realize we're lost. We have a humility that we don't have while we're in the kingdom of sin. I can remember going to confession and going out and getting drunk. It didn't make any sense, but when I realized and took a good look, look at myself and I saw that I was immoral and a drunk, I prayed, God help me, I can't help myself. That's when He seeks and saves that which is lost. And He did that not with pride, but with humility, with desperation. I'm sure that Zacchaeus didn't have many friends. I knew an IRS fan that was in the church. He said, Jack, I'd be glad to give you the taxes for No, no, that's okay. <laughs> There's a certain reputation. <clears throat> But he saw him now. He saw him coming. He, he reached out for him. And that's what God, that's what God does. He seeks and saves by his promise. You ask him, how come I got away with so many things? Because he had a plan to do it. He had a come to it. By desperation and humility. Thank you for sharing that, brother. Yeah, maybe it's that desperation and humility that forces that that helplessness that puts us in that, but realizing how dependent we are. On God that forms that childlike trust. Any other comments? Again, for Haley's Bible Handbook, uh, he, he writes, Heaven will be exclusively occupied by childlike people. No pompous fellows in heaven, strutting around as if they own the universe. There are plenty of them uh, in the church here, but not so up there. These are Haley's words. I didn't write that. about. <laughs> A little child is teachable. Trustful, free from mental pride, unsophisticated, and loving. I love those adjectives. I was looking for some sort of adjectives to describe a childlike heart. Jesus loved children. The disciples did not think children were important enough to bother with. And that made Jesus, as Dr. Zayas read, indignant. Here's another adjective for us. That made Jesus indignant that his disciples would, would push children away from him. It's an interesting comparison that the person who comes next to Jesus Who's next after the little children? It's consistent with Matthew's account in chapter 19 as well. Yes, the rich young ruler. Somebody who takes care of his own business, right, and does it well. He's got everything. He's got everything in order except for that, that level of confidence, except for that childlike heart, except for having a complete dependence on God. I have a couple quotes here, uh, and that will end our morning for us. We don't stop playing because we grow old. We grow old because we stop playing. I love my child heart even more now that I am older. It keeps me open to many mysteries there, where without it, I could not see. I thought that tied very nicely back to our discussion before about... Uh, there's our ability to see and how the condition of our heart is very much related to our, our ability, maybe our willingness uh, to see the opportunities in front of us and to live in the moment anxiety-free uh, with Jesus. All right, my brothers and sisters, we have wrapped up Zacchaeus, Jesus, and the little children. I think we've tied them together with a common theme. Next week, we're going to cover the condemned woman and Jesus' baptism. And then uh, in front of that, wrapping up the class, we have the fig trees encounter with Jesus. And uh, then I'd really like to talk about your favorite encounters. Uh, we'll have some lesson material planned. We'll look at John's I am statements there in mid-February. But on February 18th, if you, if you are willing to share for just a minute or two your favorite encounters with Jesus uh, from the scriptures, I think that would mean a lot uh, to the class. And then we'll look at Jesus at the cross and Jesus after the cross for our final lesson. Let's close today in prayer, please. Dear Righteous and Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the day that has been given to us, for the hour that we just spent in your word, Lord, and we thank you for the hour that is coming ahead as we worship you. Please uh, continue to be with the leaders of this congregation and all the families who are represented uh, here today. Please continue to bless us, guard us, and keep us well, Lord. Help us to have childlike hearts. Help us to see opportunities to serve. Help us to serve joyfully. Lord, help us to desire to please Jesus, to always see Jesus, to always lean toward him to always be connected toward him and to love him. Lord, for he knows that he, we know that he loves us. Thank you for Jesus, and we pray to you in his name. Amen.